it deals with ancient you know numerology and how it relates to the, the time cycles and so forth this is an interesting this is a very interesting table right here of ancient time cycles and we can see the name of the period we have decans we have two decans which was 10 degrees one decan was 10 degrees of the ecliptic two was 20 we had three decans which was one platonic month we had a sero cycle Sitchin actually talks about that sero cycle based on a 66 times 60 all call, also called a shar that was in Sumerian Babylonia three platonic months was one platonic season and then we had one great year we've been talking about that and here are the duration in annual cycles or sacred years. The sacred year was 360 days. Okay, and some of the stuff I skipped over was that the, the scholar was talking about how ancient calendars from all over the world had a, oftentimes had a sacred calendar of precisely 360 days, as compo compared to the secular calendar of 365 and a quarter. And the idea was there that the mathematical ideal was represented by the 360 day. But this is shows how it all breaks down in the classes. This is actually one of the handouts. But in terms of our years, this is how this is how they're measured. You know, the 720 years was a decan, two decans was 1440, the three was the 2160. We've encountered that number already. Um, then the Saro cycle was 3600. The Platonic month was 60. Uh, platonic season was 6480, and then finally. You know, four of these or 12 of these gives us the length of the great year. Now, one of the things that the, I will do this one quote here. Um, I'll back up real quick. For, this is a, a, a scholar of, of ancient traditions back in 1923 writing this. He says, the time was equaled with space. Time was equaled with space. And 12 times 30 gave the 360 days for the year. In Babylonia, Egypt, India, and Mexico, the year was one of 360 days to which five godless or unlucky days were added, <laughs> during which no laws obtained. That the Mexicans should have originated this system quite independently is difficult to believe. Okay, well this is referring to the 360 day sacred calendar and when they were running the sacred calendar they just left those five days off and they basically said this is outside the organized rules of society so, you know, have at it, have at it right. This is, this is the, that's when the five gods were born. And, and the, five, the five netters, right? Yes, Isis is the who were the five? Isis, Isis, Nephthys, Osiris, Seth, Nephthys, and Horus. Right, and, and so in Egypt, what Amina just said is that uh, that those five days were the days actually in which their five gods were considered to be born. Right? right. Am I right? Okay. A more practical level, at the start of the of, of winter, you have five days on which the sun does not appear to increase in. Right, Flanks. flanking the solstice, right? Sorry. Flanking the solstice, the winter solstice. Yeah. Okay. So with this idea of the equating time and space, let's go back to this real quick. Now, uh, who's got the calculator? Okay. Now we're going to try to run through this real quick so you can see how this con this works. We've got here the platonic solids. There's five of them and only five. I won't get into explaining that because we'll use up all the time. Here's the simplest one. This is a tetrahedron, consists of four sides. We measure this tetrahedron using the system of, of angular measure, 360 degrees, right? Each face, we have one, two, three, four faces, right? 180 degrees per face. All triangles have 180 degrees. Lee, what's four times 180? Most of you can do that in your minds, I think. I'm going to, okay, so I'm going to write this down up here. The tetra is measured by 720 degrees. Okay, uh, let's take the octahedron. We have 180 times 8. What is that, Lee? Okay, so we have the octahedron, octa is measured by 1440 degrees. All right, well, let's keep going. Here we have a cube, also called a hexahedron. 90, 90, 90, and 90. Four times 90 is 
360 times 6. 360 times 6, Lee. 2160. 2160, says Lee. 2160. Okay, let's try the icosahedron. Triangular faces, 180 degrees each, 20 faces. What's the angular measure of the icosahedron? Okay, so icosa is 3,600. Then finally, we have a dodecahedron, dodeca. And that's this beautiful little figure. And we, they're each are pentagons. Angle on each edge is 108. So you have 108 times 5 is 540. Lee, what's 540 times 12? As if you couldn't guess. 6480. Now, you see here how the same numbers are measuring time and space? This is a beautiful little example of how we can get the same family of sacred numbers or canon of sacred numbers and discover that they are embedded both in the measure of time and the measure of space. What's the shape for the great year? Oh, what's the shape for... Uh, good question, Marty. In order to get the great year, you have to perform a nesting. We do that in class. The nesting. Yes. Well, I, I can show you, uh, give you a couple of quick examples. Look here. The icosa has 20 faces and 12 corners or vertices. The dodeca has 12 faces and 20 corners. So 20 faces, 12 corners, 12 faces, 20 corners. There's a correlation there. That's one example. Uh, another example would be cube. Six faces, eight corners, the octahedron. Eight faces, six corners. They are duals of each other. And there is a way that these interface. That's in the nesting sequence, and that's in my advanced classes. <laughs> what? The ball. Say what? The The buckyball was composed of pentagons and hexagons. It wasn't actually one of the regular polyhedras. Here are the list of the reigns of the... These, these are from uh, writings of uh, ancient historians such as Barossus and also from uh, cuneiform tablets impressed upon clay that we get this. The ten kings, and these were the, notice, pre-diluvian. What does pre-diluvian mean? Before the flood, right. Now, if you begin to notice the, the, the numbers making up their range, you'll see they're all sacred numbers. Every one of them. And they're all numbers that we, we study in, in a course or a curriculum of sacred geometry. And they total to 432,000. And then we go to the Mayan world ages and we discover the same numbers or variants of the same numbers. And then we go to the Vedic ages find the same numbers again, and you'll notice that the Vedic numbers pick up where the Babylonian numbers leave off. The Babylonian numbers essentially carry us from the great year to the yuga, and then the Vedic numbers pick it up with the yugas and go up to like the kalpas, which is the whole age of the universe. But you'll notice that the, that the building block of their, their uh, yuga system is 432,000 years. And this is doubled that, that's tripled, quadrupled, and this is 10 times that, or the sum of all of these. 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 equals 10. So you see that they're building from 432,000 up to 4,320,000. And um, which should immediately suggest to you that the Vedic system and the Babylonian system are perhaps linked, if not just two portions of what was once one system, perhaps which survived in a fragmentary form being preserved partially by the Babylonians and partial, partial, partially by the, the authors of the ancient Vedas. i got to skip past some of this because... Uh, oh, God, this is interesting stuff. <laughs> okay, 
from the Persian, yeah. In uh, the world year of the Persians, the notion of, a, of cyclically recurrent cosmic disasters, a catastrophe by flood, alternating with one by fire, has been traced from ancient Babylonian Iran through Pythagorean and Stoic philosophy and thence into the medieval world. In classical Greek and Hellenistic literature, the doctrine of the great year was already connected with the myths of the deluge and ekparosis. What's ekparosis? Fire. Destruction of the world by fire, yes. These catastrophes were supposed to return periodically when the planets came together in certain signs of the zodiac. In the Persian tradition, we still find the deluge connected with a conjunction of the planets. Now this, is, I think, is a very important clue as to the inherent predictability, if there is such a thing within this system. Um, yeah, we're, oh yeah, okay, so here we have idea of, uh, the idea of a world span of 12,000 years, and I think that that's reflecting essentially the time that it was conceived during which our current world age was, you know, in other words, the length of time which we were in the current world age which we see is not that much different than the geological, essentially 12,000, whether it's 10,000 or 12,000 years, the geological name for it is the Holocene. So really are we down to the, okay. 15 more minutes, okay. Okay, now, here we're getting to the scientific confirmation of all the old ancient traditions, which to me this is where it gets really exciting. Because I know some of these scientists, and I've talked to some of them, and you know they uh, are usually, in most cases, very reluctant to say, admit in any way that somebody may have already known a lot of this stuff <laughs> once upon a time. This little graph here, as, you, as it's entitled, the present interglacial, and you can see here that what we're looking at is, you know, there's Greenland. Can you get the layout? Hudson Bay. There's Florida down there. So this is the way we look now, interglacial. Back up that clock 13,000 years ago to the beginning of the age of Leo, and it looked like that. Now, the summer of the great year, the winter of the great year. You see, this was the winter of the great year. Now, when you pile up that much ice, the water forming that ice ultimately came from where? Oceans. Now, when you pile up that much ice, what do you suppose is going to happen to the volume of ocean water? shrinks. And in fact, during the peak of the Ice Age, sea levels worldwide were somewhere around 400 feet lower than now. So when that ice melted, basically you had a global sea level rise of 400 feet. That's pretty significant. I mean, if you consider now the, 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 some of the hysteria surrounding global warming, you'll find that fears are, you know, six inches. But I'm going to show you here global warming. Right, you want to see global warming. I'm going to talk about global warming in the time that we have remaining. Here's another color graphic of basically focused on North America. And basically you can see there's no Great Lakes up there. This was not the farthest south also that the ice came. If, if you go north from here, uh, essentially the Kentucky-Ohio border, it's, it's formed by the Ohio River. And the Ohio River, during the, one of the earlier glaciations, the ice came further south. Here's the Ohio River coming through here. And that was actually formed by the river flowing around the southern margin of the ice sheet. That little box there is an area that me and Brad back there, we've been doing field research for about seven years out there. We've made numerous trips out there because that happens to be on planet Earth, one of the most spectacular examples of the last of landscapes created during the last global catastrophe are right there. Although once you begin to recognize them, they're everywhere. And part of what I'm trying to do in some of my classes now is teach people how to recognize the effects. I'm going to speed through some of this um, and get to the graphics and the charts because we're running out of time.
we'll stop here for a minute, the energy paradox. You see, before the advent of radiocarbon dating, and then we're talking here up until the 1950s, it was generally believed that the end of the ice age took 50,000 or more years. And that was based upon what we, the rates at which we had seen modern glaciers recede. And extrapolating from modern glaciers receding, like at the end of the Little Ice Age, to the Big Ice Age, they assumed that it would take 50,000 years or more. And that was also based upon the straightforward physics of converting ice to water and returning that water to the ocean. It takes a certain amount of heat to melt ice, and that heat is energy, right? So just to have an analog, what they did was they took... Um, they took models. For example, if you had one cubic mile of ice and you put it at, a, say, a northern latitude, like, like um, you know, up where, uh, like up in Canada, how long would it take to melt? If you took it and you put it at the equator, how long would it take to melt? Okay. Then what happened was radiocarbon dating started coming along, and they and they started dating the effects of the last ice age. And the first thing they realized was that the ice was there fully intact up to 13,000 years ago. Now, and then by eight, between eight and 9,000 years ago, it was all gone. Now, if you read the literature from the 1950s to the 1990s, what you discover is we went from 50,000 to 25,000, to 25,000 to 10,000, from 10,000 to 3,000, from 3,000 to 1,000. And essentially what we're at now is that we got rid of between the beginning of the age of Leo, most of the ice was there, if not all of the ice. At the end of the age of Leo, most of the ice, if not all of the ice, was gone. And this has created the energy paradox. Now, the energy paradox first emerged back in 1973 when they were still allowing, oh, I think 15,000 or so years for the whole process. And what they did is if they said, well, if you got this ice cap, you get rid of the whole thing in 15,000 years, it has to recede 260 meters a year per year. And then at the end of that whole process, it's gone. But to get rid of that much ice, it takes a certain amount of energy. This is, if you read here, it says, the average annual rate of marginal retreat of the Laurentide ice sheet calculated from the reduction in area was 260 meters a year. This high figure immediately raises the question of what energy sources are available to cause such a rapid retreat. Now, as it turns out, since that was written, the energy paradox has only become more acute because the duration has been reduced from, say, 12 to 15,000 years to 2 to 3,000 years. And within that 2 to 3,000 years, it wasn't a smooth process, as, as the graphs that you're about to see. Um, so, three years later, they hadn't resolved the energy paradox. This is a one of the distinguished climate scientists here, Kenneth F. Hare, writing, the retreat of the Laurentide ice just discussed poses a major unresolved question of energetics. From where was the energy derived to bring about so rapid a wasting of the ice sheet? As it turned out, when they did the calculations, and they took that ice sheet and they put it at the equator where the greatest amount of energy was available, it still took in the neighborhood of 30 to 40,000 years to melt the whole damn thing. And we're talking about Canada. So see, here is a mystery that has been raised that no one has to this day solved. If you see the, the presence of melted glass in Scotland, you know, it suggests a source of heat from somewhere. If you see that graph, basically what it's telling us is that the temperature has been constantly shifting. Let's go to another graph. That's just pole shift stuff. That's not important. I'll just zip past that. <laughs> Since we're running out of time here. <laughs> you guys are, you, you're reading this, right? Yeah. 
All right. Here's Holocene. Now, y'all know what the term Holocene now means. And look at here is 12,000. Here, this is we got a lot of different te te uh, temperature proxies incorporated into this. The mean temperature is the heavy black line. Now, essentially, you can see that what's happening here is we're coming up out of the ice age and warming. Now, if you look at this, you'll see that it's going up and down and up and down. Now, the thing that I was talking about, that climatic optimum during the, the age of the goddess, Cancer and, and Gemini, that was right in here. You see this, where it gets quite warm? Then, at the end of the age of Taurus, here's where it cools off. Here's where we're at now. Okay. Now, if you look at that, you wouldn't necessarily conclude that getting another degree or two warmer is going to be anything out of the norm that the climate has been doing all by itself for tens if not hundreds of thousands if not millions of years. That's one thing that this graph here clearly demonstrates. Um, that the temperature of the planet has been warmer than it has in the past. In fact, this right here is what we know as the Little Ice Age. And this was the uh, medieval warm period. Medieval warm period was when they were building colonies in Greenland and growing vineyards in England, which they're not doing now. Some studies suggest that sea level was 10 feet higher right here than it is now. And that with this cooling here, sea levels dropped because glaciers expanded. Generally now, the timing of this thing suggests that the Little Ice Age, in some studies, suggests that the Little Ice Age is still ending. That it's not we're not completely out of it yet. Um, this graph represents the rate at which meltwater from the ice caps was reintroduced to the ocean. And if you look at the dating on here, this is 13,000 years right here. Now, right here is 9,000 years. So you can see between 13,000 and 10,000 years, what is this graph telling you? The old graph is superimposed for purposes of comparison. In the old graph, you had at the end of the ice age, you had a beginning of the melting. The melting increased at a smooth rate, reached a peak, and then slowly tapered off, right? At the end, the ice was gone. This graph shows that there wasn't anything like that. In fact, that it was two great meltwater pulses that most of the melting occurred in these two narrow little pulses. Which makes that whole energy paradox that much more difficult to resolve and will never be resolved as long as they're looking for solutions that are totally based on Earth. As soon as they're willing to expand their horizons and think cosmically, then I think this, the, the problem can be solved. The final graph that we will look at is this is, this is a graph of temperature changes during the Holocene. This is taken from cores extracted from the center of the Greenland ice sheet. Okay. Down this side we have the years going down to 10,000 years ago. This is depth. Okay. 1,500 meters of depth. So in other words, in 10,000 years there were, there were 1,500 meters of ice accumulated. Now, in this ice there are annual layers. Okay, just like in tree rings, you have an annual layer and you can look at those rings and you can decipher information about the climate at the time of those, right? The ice cores are exactly the same way. You have an annual snowfall. In that snowfall, you have, you have dust, you have soot, you have organic material, you have pollen, you have oxygen isotopes. All of these things are indicators of what's going on in the climate around. This is based on oxygen isotopes. Oxygen isotopes, without it getting into an explanation, they're a proxy for temperature change. And basically, the, um, the, um, the shift in oxygen isotopes this way and this way re reflects to the left means that it's getting colder, and to the right means it's getting warmer. Okay, so now you'll notice that, that it seems to be constantly in a state of flux with an extreme change of perhaps two degrees, this translates into about two degrees centigrade of temperature change, right? Globe, this is basically northern hemisphere, but it's almost certainly going to be true for the whole planet. Now, we go back, we go down here, and you notice there's a little blip right there, a cooling blip at 8,400 years ago. And then the next slide will... 
Okay, now there's the same graph reduced, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take it down another 100,000 or so years. What is this telling us, people? Now, I was talking before about global warming. Right there, right here. Now, if you look at this graph closely, something very interesting shows up. Remember the graph we just saw of the meltwater spikes? First meltwater spike corresponds with this spike of warming. And then you saw how the spike went back down as if the, you know, it poured off huge amounts of meltwater, but then the meltwater stopped, apparently, presumably, because it went cold again. Then there was the second spike, right? That corresponds with that line right there. So the two graphs reinforce each other very dramatically. We have here temperature. We're going into depth of the ice age right here, and then we get to roughly 13,000 years ago, and bam, we have this massive warming. Interestingly, this is the age of Leo right here. That's it right there. So then we had this massive warming. Then it went back to the full depth of glacial cold, and then it spazzed out of that. And, and it's almost as if the planet was made two attempts. The first attempt to get out of the Ice Age didn't succeed. It took the second effort to get out of the Ice Age. And then we had this gradual warming up to this point, and then it's fluctuated back and forth from, from then to now. Now, I want you to notice this, this is the most accurate climate change model we've got. This is, the last 10,000 years literally goes almost a year by year basis, okay? Now, if you look at this, one thing you'll notice is that nowhere in this graph, nowhere at no time was the climate stable. The fluctuations, the magnitude of the fluctuations, of course, was much smaller here than here. But at no time has the climate been stable. It's either been cooling down or warming up, or cooling down or warming up. It has never stayed the same more than 10 or 20 years that anybody in the record has been able to discern. So based upon that fact, one would assume that we shouldn't expect that right now the climate should all of a sudden, contrary to millions of years of history, decide to stabilize and then stay there. And we need to factor this in. When we, when we have the debate, the national debate on global warming, this information needs to be addressed. And if it's not, the debate isn't, isn't complete, see? Because this tells me that, you know, that you know, what we would expect from these, from these graphs of what's happened in the past is that the climate is going to continue to warm for a while, and then at some point it'll begin to cool again, just like it did. If we go back to 600 AD, we went into a very cold period that was associated with the onset of the Dark Ages in Europe. That extreme cold period was followed by the medieval warm period, during which the Vikings went and were settling Greenland, and they were building the vineyards in England. The medieval warm period was terminated by the Little Ice Age, which lasted for 300 years. The Little Ice Age essentially began to end about 150 years ago, coincidentally with the onset of the Industrial Revolution. But as it turns out, the onset of the Industrial Revolution was partially uh, enhanced, partially uh, affected by the ending of the Little Ice Age, because it, it created uh, an agricultural boon in Europe uh, and created huge uh, surpluses of food that then allowed people to have free time to start exploring, you know, science and inventions and, and art and things like that. So there was definitely a connection between the climate change and its reflection into human society. I had one, I presented this about a year ago to a group and after, after one, um, I guess he was a hardcore environmental, and, and by the way, I consider myself an environmentalist. Okay, and totally believe that we need to learn how to live in harmony with our planet. However, we need to have a, a scientific approach to it. We can't basically base this upon superstition. Okay, that's my opinion. One guy did not like this. He didn't like this information I was showing because he was totally wedded, had his complete mo emotional investment in this belief that we humans were the sole cause of climate change. And so when he was being presented with this other information, he, it didn't sync with, with his mindset that he had, had cultivated. I invited him to come, and he was challenging me on some points, and we were, of course, running out of time like we always do. I invited him to come back the following week, and I would address every point he raised, and he, I never saw him again. So I don't know what that means. But 
Randall, do you have any thoughts as to what caused those two energy spikes? Yes, I do. But we're running out of time, so... <laughs> <laughs> this is how I get you to come back. <laughs> Excuse me, I, yes. It feels like you're kind of winding up here because you left this with a cliffhanger, and I'm still thinking about what is the cause of those sudden changes. And I'd really like you to address that before we end. In, in, in five seconds. I know it might be frustrating. I have one entire slideshow devoted to it. Oh, how about just you could just tell? Well, I've already given you a, a very, I think, a very salient hint which is that it's something outside. It's outside. And there have been front of our sun. That might be it. There have been a great number of predictions about these times, our lifetime. Mm -hmm. Such a thing could happen again. Yes. What's your feeling? Okay, let me just, a very quick story. The boy who cried wolf. You know that story. He kept pretending, first, first he made it up, then he started thinking, you know, he'd see variations in the this, this story, whether he believed it or not. The, the upshot of it was that, you know, he was supposed to watch the sheep. He got bored sitting watching the sheep all night, so he decided for a little fun, he'd run down to the village and tell them that a wolf had come and was going to eat the sheep, and everybody goes running up there in a panic to chase the wolf off, and there's no wolf. After the third time he did it, they said, you're full of it. So then he comes down and he says, the wolf is coming and eating the sheep. When the wolf finally showed up at the door, finally showed up at the, at the camp, nobody believed him, and then the, the, the sheep, I mean, the wolf feasted on the sheep. And now, you know, if you read Aesop's fables, he'll say, you know, if you, if, you, if, you tell the tr if you don't tell the truth, you know, then finally, even if when it is true, people won't believe you. But the other moral of the story is, is that I think is that no matter how many times this guy cried wolf falsely, that didn't mean that the wolf wasn't, Gonna, wasn't real and didn't eventually show up. And I know that, you know, going back to the time I was in high school and all of the predictions of catastrophe from, you know, California, I used to have a, in, in my junior year of high school, I had a poster up on my wall that said, goodbye, California, and it showed California falling into the ocean, you know, and then it was Comet Kahootek, and then it was something in November of 1978, and then it was something in 1980, then there was something in 1983, and I mean, you know, and then there was May 5th of 2000, and well, you know, Book of Matthew says, well, when the, when, when the disciples asked Jesus, when, well, when is all of this, the shit supposed to hit the fan? He says, well, nobody knows. Only the big guy upstairs knows, and he ain't talking. The point is, the point is, it's a reality and you get prepared and get ready and cultivate the appropriate mindset because you don't know. Remember what he says, that the allegory he says is, you know, the master of the house goes away and then everybody's having this big party. Well, if they knew when the master was coming back, then they would have stopped and cleaned up, but they didn't know when he was coming back. So his, his, his parable was that since you don't know when the master of the house is going to come back, you better keep the house in order because he is going to come back, see? And that's the only thing I can, people are always saying, well, when is it going to happen? And you know, the truth of the matter is, I don't know what's going to happen. However, I do think we'll have enough forewarning. But this, see, there's another, there's another angle to this thing, too. I think once having identified the nature of the wolf, only then do we know how to take the appropriate response. And I do think that the ancient traditions are telling us, look, there is a cycle of catastrophe. But it's not foreordained and it's not a given because there's a wild card in the equation. And that's human intelligence. You see, this isn't like, you know, this, this is not a doom and gloom type of a thing. But I'm not, I'm not up here trying to like scare you guys into submission and throwing up your hands and go, oh, we're all doomed. Because that's not what the message here is. The message here is that it, it'd be the same message if you went down and you told somebody living on the Gulf Coast, look, you're prone to hurricanes here. That doesn't mean you throw up your hands in a panic. It simply means that you do what you've got to do to deal with it, you see. If you ignore it, yeah, you're going to suffer the consequences. Yes, Amina. Is it true that there probably have never been six billion people on the earth before? Do you know? No, I don't know. But, but you know, just when we get into the thing, I do think that the population of this planet has grown to, to large numbers and been dramatically diminished more than once. That I believe. When we get to, when, if we do the classes, one of the things that I'm going to show you is my studies of the vast civilization that was here in 
North America before the Europeans arrived and the mystery of what happened to it. Because there was a vast, very sophisticated civilization on this continent and very few people know about it other than in bits and pieces. And it was as advanced as the Egyptians, it was as advanced as the Sumerians. In fact, was probably in contact with the Egyptians and Sumerians. Who, who might be interested in a more extensive study? If you are, raise your hands and hopefully I'll have enough.